You're listening to The Complete Human Podcast, hosted by co-founders Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We share authentic conversations about wellness, longevity, personal growth, and bio-optimization, along with inspiring stories that encourage community and social responsibility. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hey guys, you may not know it, but my morning coffee connects me to millions of women coffee farmers across the world. Women coffee farmers often face tremendous hardships, including horrible working conditions, little pay, and abuse. Complete Human has decided to do something about this problem by launching a line of coffee where the proceeds from those sales go to support women coffee farmers around the world. Not only is every bag of Cafe Caramea single batch organic coffee delicious, but the proceeds go directly to these women looking to break the long cycle of oppression. These funds help them enact real change in their communities and gives them a fair price for every pound of coffee their small micro farms produce. Most of us drink coffee every morning. Now that morning cup can be a source of real change in the world. Head on over to store.completehuman.com to purchase your bag of Cafe Caramea. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. So a couple of weeks ago, we dropped our podcast on our ayahuasca experiment experience in the mountains of Peru. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a ton of questions on that. We got a lot of feedback on that one. A lot of feedback. A lot of questions, and it's obviously an interest. It's, it's obviously of interest. And, and as we start to see more and more documentaries come out about that as, you know, how to change your mind hit New York Times bestseller, as we start to see more and more of a conversation about psychedelics in therapy for therapeutic benefits, we decided that we were going to go a little bit more on a deep dive on this one. Mm-hmm. So um, that tees up our next guest, Dr. Ingmar Gorman. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if you have a specific moniker, but uh, it, it kind of sounds like in all the research, we could call you the psychedelic doc. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm a psychologist, so not to be confused with a medical doctor, but I, am, I do have a doctorate. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm happy to say a little bit about myself. Would that yeah, be all please, right? Yeah, please. Please. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a psychologist in the world of psychedelics. I kind of wear multiple hats. Uh, one of them is currently as a co-principal investigator. So a principal investigator is somebody who you know, runs a study, uh, and, uh, you may be familiar with MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, they're a nonprofit, uh, organization that really has been a major player, uh, and really Rick Doblin, who heads that organization, uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit for where we are today in terms of psychedelic research. So I'm a co-principal investigator on a MAPS-sponsored study, uh, phase two and phase three studies of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. I had mentioned uh, PTSD in the intro. Uh, And so I help run that site, and I'm a therapist on that site. And so that means I kind of help with the staffing. I help with all kinds of research kind of issues, data management issues that might come up. Uh, but I also see participants. We don't call them patients because it's research. Um, <laughs> so I, I have that contact and I can share a little bit about that with you all. Another hat that I wear is the co-founder of a company called Fluence. And that is a psychedelic uh, education company for mostly mental health medical professionals. And I'd love to share a little bit more about that. But the brief kind of con- intro to that is that, well, as you had mentioned there's a lot of interest now in psychedelics as their therapies, but really if you ha- went through uh, any kind of formal training as a mental health provider, you probably got less than an hour worth of education about psychedelics. And so what we're doing is we are kind of making up for that gap, which has implications not just for uh, therapists and people receiving therapy, but um, I think there's also an element of uh, critically viewing the drug war and various social policies that have kind of closed down conversation and even disproportionately affected certain groups um, in the United States um, due to, to that policy. Uh, so those are kind of the two major things that I do. I also have a private practice and have some projects here and there as well. But um, those are my two main uh, focuses. And you have a 14-month-old. And I have a 14-month-old, yes, yes. So you're a, job, uh, right? you're a busy man. 
Indeed, I am. Yeah, I try to, to balance it all. Um, yeah, luckily, where we are located, we do have daycare. And so that's really helpful. Um, but without daycare, it was a real, really intense. Yeah, trying to do that much work. Believe me, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I've aged 47 years in the last <laughs> six months. I'm actually 19. Uh, <laughs> right. I just look this old. Um, it's amazing. So, Ingmar, I, th there's a lot of things that we want to talk about with everything that you just, you know, that you just went through. One of the things that I, I'm really interested in discussing and, and kind of reframing or at least letting our listeners know is what does, as you guys get into the clinical aspects of research around some of these psychedelics, what does that do for the legal landscape? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So maybe as a backdrop for people who may not know, <clears throat> the psychedelics, the classic psychedelics, things like uh, psilocybin, LSD, um, but you may know that marijuana, cannabis is also falls under this category, as does MDMA. Those are schedule one compounds. <clears throat> schedule one means that they have, by definition, a high potential for abuse and no medical use. And so that really was in the 1970s that the and MDMA in the 1980s were, was classified under that uh, category. Um, and so that means uh, obviously that it's, it cannot be prescribed. <clears throat> There's no currently no medical use. But as you raise this, uh, Evan, this question, uh, the research that's happening is sort of calling that into question. So the more evidence that we collect that shows the therapeutic potential of these compounds, um, there is inevitably going, something's going to have to happen. Uh, either um, the drugs will be rescheduled. Hey, hey guys, Jana Breslin here again. Most of you have heard me speak on the benefits of beets. Beets are well known as a powerful superfood and help the body create nitric oxide, the miracle molecule that supports a healthy cardiovascular system and sexual function. As an athlete, the nitric oxide boosting benefits help me power through workouts better than any artificial pre-workout I've ever taken. Now, this is why we created Complete Human Res Beet. You get all of the benefits of organic beets with additional anti-aging support from fermented resveratrol. Resveratrol is a longevity gene activator and is something I have turned to for years to help support anti-aging and optimal health. If you're not a fan of the taste of beets, we've got you covered with our all-natural and delicious dark cherry flavor. I take Resbeet twice a day and I have to say I feel incredible. Head on over to store.completehuman.com and enter the code podcast at checkout to get 20% off. Or there might be... Uh, so... Um, now we're getting into the nuance of it, which is quite interesting. <laughs> um, some are, people are hoping that the compounds will be rescheduled, that they'll go from, say, something that's Schedule 1 to, say, something that's Schedule 2 or 3, where uh, they can be prescribed, they have medicinal value, but they're still um, uh, monitored for, you know, they're still controlled substances. So that if somebody were to use it outside of that context or sell it uh, illegally, there will still be punishment for it. Mm -hmm. Fewer people are familiar with the idea, and this has happened in the past, where you would keep, say, something like MDMA as a Schedule One drug, but then create another like na name or label for that same compound and put into Schedule Three. And that would, I think, have less of a kind of um, impact on, say, drug policy than decriminalization might, right? So we are, or rescheduling. So these are sort of these complex, and we don't know what's going to happen um, in the future. So as a scientist, I kind of have to say that, you know, the data is not quite in yet, even around MDMA or psilocybin. We have initial data that shows that these could be good for certain kind of indications, but we haven't gotten past the sort of gold standard, which would be completing phase three clinical trials. And at that point, once we get past phase three, something's going to have, have to happening or have to happen around scheduling. So that brings up something really interesting. And, and I kind of want to take a step back in time and look at, sure. you know, kind of like Timothy Leary and some of the experiments that came out of Harvard. Um, my understanding was that MDMA was originally used as like a couples therapy drug. So there's a history of therapeutic use in this. Then it becomes kind of the counterculture drugs, you know, goes on schedule one. But as we start to look at the gold standard of, you know, double blind, placebo controlled, you know, all of these, does the psychedelic community have a you know have a benchmark or a litmus test that's so much higher than shall we say 
any other drug because as we know, set and setting becomes so essential in the use of, of these. So we could have a very powerful compound that by and large works for things like depression, PTSD, but in the hands of the wrong therapist, you know, could be catastrophic. And I think that's what we saw out of the 60s with, you know, with, mm -hmm. with, with Timothy. So how do, how do you guys navigate, I hate that word, but uh, how do you guys navigate what is, is ultimately going to be a very tumultuous road to, to get hardcore clinical data that shows that these things work? Right, right. Very good question. Uh, also very nuanced. Um, well, so I would say, and I, because I hear you saying multiple things. One, I just want to make clear that in terms of the standard from the medical community and the FDA, in terms of what what the threshold we need to meet to um, see if these compounds could become medicines, they are no more stringent than they would be for any other compound. So it's not like, just to be clear, that the, the sort of the established regu regulatory bodies are saying, oh, well, because it's MDMA or psilocybin, you you're going to have a harder time. Uh, that might have been true a little bit earlier on, a few decades ago or a decade ago, where, you know, the, the data that they were looking for to show that they were safe was uh, they were really looking for a lot of safety data. But today, I, I wouldn't say that we're kind of discriminated against in any kind of way. But the question that you, what I heard you raise was about the psychedelics community's standard for uh, providing the treatment. And I think that's a really important question to be asking because um, the psychedelic community being people who are, I, I don't mean this to be derogatory in any way, but I like to say like the fans, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? They, they actually really like, they, they look into the history, they go to the conferences, you know, uh, as a community, um, they want these um, compounds to be shepherded in the right way. And there was a there is a history that we don't want to repeat and that was in the 1950s and 60s um you saw uh, right so there was this first maybe second wave of research and um there were there was very little regulation around these compounds in fact you could simply write a letter to sandos on the university letterhead saying that you want lsd and they would send it to you um, and so what happened, though, was that there were some people at that time, some researchers who were familiar with the idea of set and setting. Uh, and the, the people that they worked with, the, the participants, tended to do pretty well in those studies. But then there were some researchers who just thought, oh, well, this is just a pharmacological agent like any other one. You just give it to somebody who's strapped in a bed in a, you know, alone, locked in a room, and it should just do its thing. And of course, people had adverse reactions to it. And so to bring up your point, Evan, as we move into the current kind of wave of research, I think it's really important that whoever is going to be working with these compounds, psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, perhaps others, um, that they are aware of this history and that they have the training to know how to work with these, um, these compounds so they don't um, kind of replicate that, that past, uh, these adverse psychological reactions that aren't, um, that are very much dependent on set and setting. So they don't uh, they may not come up so quickly as like uh, blood pressure increasing, right? That's something that reliably can happen. But with these psychological effects, we really have to be more attuned to the experience. Mm -hmm. So one, so to play off of that, um, Ingmar, I think if we look at schedule one as the, the definition of something that has the potential to become addictive and, and potentially harmful, is that really true with some of these drugs? Because everything that I've read says no. Yeah, generally, so this is <laughs> psychedelics. <laughs> psychedelics, right, the, 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 um, that comes from um, kind of a Greek uh, term uh, or, or two Greek terms, mind manifesting, right? And so um, there are a lot of different things that can fall under that idea. So I had used earlier the terms classic serotonergic or classic hallucinogens. And those are things like LSD, DMT, uh, psilocybin, those tend not to be uh, addictive. They actually tend to be almost anti-addictive in some ways. Uh, difficulty um, developing a tolerance to them. Um, people uh, don't take them in a way that they're trying to re relieve withdrawal, which, which happens with other compounds. Um, and the people tend to have pretty intense experiences that they don't necessarily want to be repeating on a daily basis. Um, but the reason why I brought up the category of psychedelics is because there are what some, what's referred to as novel psychoactive compounds, which uh, are new derivatives or new kind of uh, drugs that, uh, we, that can be ordered from Asia. I don't know if people are still doing that, but 
was something that was done, you know, five, 10 years ago. And uh, we don't know. So I, so it's sort of a, the answer is, yeah, the classic psychedelics tend not to be addictive or as harmful in terms of um, the classic kind of drug uh, concerns, but there are all sorts of things that could be psychedelics that could be potentially harmful. Um, and also to define harm as not just dependence um, or abuse, but psychedelics do have a little bit of a harm profile around the intensity of the experience that they um, create. And then we have to be wary of sort of the psychological um, kind of composition of the person who's taking the drug, that it could be potentially overwhelming for a person uh, psychologically. Uh, and then, of course, we should also talk about some of the physiological reactions, like I had mentioned blood pressure, right? So if somebody has uncontrolled hypertension, we don't really want them to be taking a psychedelic because they could um, have a cardiovascular event. Gotcha. But generally, they're, compared to a lot of the different substances that are out there, they tend to be safe, but there are certain caveats there. So if you were to have one of those pharmaceutical commercials on the TV where they have to list the, uh -huh. uh, the, the um, uh, side effects at the end, you know, they would be fairly minimal in comparison to like, you know, your average, <laughs> you know, restless leg syndrome drug. Well, that's a really, I mean, that's the, that is in some ways the, what we're, we're identifying right now. So in the clinical trial with MDMA, we have to report every adverse event. Um, and this is, if you ever dreamt of becoming a psychedelic researcher, you, you might want to reconsider it um, <laughs> just because of the amount of documentation that's necessary. Um, so uh, whenever, um, whenever anything happens to a, a participant, whether it's related to the drug or not, we have to note it down. So we, the classic example is a participant at home, not in the study, stubs their toe. We have to document that they stubbed their toe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess if enough people stub their toe on the study, it may become that little thing that you hear in the commercial. Mm -hmm. So this is all to say that right now what we're doing is we are monitoring every single kind of reaction a person can have, whether it's directly related to the, the drug or being in the study or not. And that will then inform that list. And um, I guess it's kind of too early to say. I mean, I, I would like to think that they're um, that they're safe, but um, I, that really the science and the evidence needs to speak to that. Um, and it would be irresponsible for me to say otherwise at this point. Have you seen a lot of stub toes so far? <laughs> no stub toes. No, <laughs> no stub toes. But for me, maybe as a harm reduction tip for anybody out there who's considering psychedelics. Um, Often in ceremony, if you were uh, in ceremony um, or uh, in other settings, people will lie down um, and they're kind of going inward. Although in ceremony, you're supposed to be sitting up, but people tend to lie down anyway. Um, be very careful about getting up too quickly because um, these uh, substances can increase the likelihood of, of fainting. And that's something that people generally don't talk about. So this is a tip out there. If you're lying down and you're doing any of this work, you know, sit up, take your time, take a minute, then stand up if you're going to go to the bathroom. In the studies, we help, we hold a person's um, arm, we make sure that they don't faint and fall and hit their head when they mm -hmm. go to the restroom. Our, our guide did that in our ayahuasca experience. And, and I, my problem is, is that I have a bladder the size of like a chipmunk's. And so, you know, <laughs> over the course of like six or seven hours, I had to get up numerous times to, you know, to use the bathroom once because I almost shat myself on her. Um, <laughs> oh. you know, but it's, yeah, it was, I remember like standing experience. up and you just feel like blood pressure drop. You're like, okay, I, I think I can do this. Um, so yeah. I, I have a quick question about this. So when, when someone is engaging in psychedelic assisted therapy, is this like, what are these sessions like? I mean, does someone come to you and then you're monitoring them throughout the whole, the whole time? Is this an hour? Is it like a five hour thing? I mean, how, what does this look like when someone comes to see you or someone who's helping um, with this type of therapy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a lot to say here. Um, so maybe I, I will, um, clarify one thing that I haven't clarified yet, um, which is that I kind of, I've practiced two things. One, which we define as psychedelic assisted therapy, and mm -hmm. then something called psychedelic integration therapy. Mm. Just to say a few words about psychedelic integration therapy. That's where I work in my private practice. And I also teach this to educate clinicians, to help them work with people who are using psychedelics on their own. 
So that might be, for example, could be you two, right? You went to Peru, you had an ayahuasca experience. Say something happens, you're feeling great or you're feeling like something is bothering you. You want to make sure that you speak to a psychologist or mental health professional who knows about psychedelics. You might contact somebody for psychedelic integration therapy to get that support around your experience and to help you integrate. Uh, or maybe even prepare for experience if you were to do it again. What you're asking me about is psychedelic assisted therapy. This is where we actually administer or I, I give somebody MDMA. And again, to really re assert this, this happens only in research contexts at this point. Um, there's an exception for ketamine, um, which we could talk about later if you like. But when we're talking about MDMA or psilocybin and we're talking about the United States, we're talking about research contexts. And so what's that? Because it's research, that actually makes your question a little bit more complicated because we have to do screening, we have to do informed consent, uh, we, we're taking all these measures for, for data purposes. So I'll put that all to the side because I'm sure you're not really, you may not be <laughs> that interested in all of those technicalities. So when it comes to the actual sessions, the psychotherapy, so I'll take, speak um, broadly when it's, we're talking about psilocybin or MDMA. We're usually talking about a person receiving the psilocybin or MDMA once, twice, maybe three times. Again, it depends on the study design, um, but usually in these studies, it's only one to three times. Um, and that would be so over the course this is of not a drug. Over the course of, say, three months. Okay. So approximately one dosing every month. That's generally what the protocols look like. And we begin usually with um, three 90-minute preparation sessions. And in these sessions, there's no drug. We're meeting maybe once a week and we're talking about the person's history. We're talking a little bit about the, the, the drug or the placebo that they might get because these are usually placebo studies, placebo controlled studies. Um, and here, this is what I think is important here is the indication, right? Because people tend to think about psychedelic assisted therapy as like one thing, but we're treating different uh, diagnoses, depression, PTSD, alcohol use, smoking. And so, um, I do think it's really important to the therapy to reflect what a person's working on. But after those three 90 minute sessions, the person will have their first dosing session. Sometimes we call it an overnight session. Sometimes we call it an experimental session. There are different words for it. Um, but those are usually eight hours long. So a person will come in in the morning. Uh, they'll check in with the therapists. Usually there are two therapists in the room. That's been the standard so far. And um, after kind of a, a brief check-in, a person will uh, receive or have the choice to take uh, the, the medicine or the, we don't know if it's a medicine, it's a drug or a placebo, but they'll take a, a pill. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and then they're there for eight hours and they're kind of, they kind of have to be there for eight hours. We don't, we don't let them leave. <laughs> they can withdraw from the study at any point, except during that, that eight hour window. Nobody's, nobody is leaving <laughs> the, the study at that point. We don't want somebody who's under the influence, you know, walking around Manhattan. Right. Um, and so here, again, it depends on what kind of indication we're working with. I'll talk about MDMA and for PTSD, because that's mostly what I do. Um, a person will, for the first, about, an hour to 90 minutes, um, MDMA, uh, Sasha Shulgin used to say, who, who kind of rediscovered MDMA in the, in the um, late 70s, he uh, used to say, you can't take the A out of MDMA. People don't usually know that A is amphetamine. So it, it is a kind of amphetamine. And so it, that's a stimulant. And so for the first 90 minutes of these sessions, people tend to feel kind of anxious and we are kind of encouraging them to relax. So they have blindfolds on, they have headphones on, they're listening to calming music. Um, and we, we see at that, that, that sort of helping kind of ease them into the experience. But after the 90 minute mark, um, if any anxiety comes up, we see that as part of the work with the trauma. And so for the eight hour period, people are kind of in between what we call going inward. So having the blindfolds on and the headphones on and going in uh, and I could talk a little bit more about why that is, if you'd like. Um, and then alternating between going in and engaging interpersonally in a therapeutic conversation with the therapists. As therapists, we're there to, we're very careful about not having an agenda. Um, the metaphor that I like is we're more like midwives to their process. We're not telling them, oh, well, you need to think about this, or this is a problem you have to figure out, or 
you know, we're not even giving interpretations or encouraging them to think about particular things. We're, we're really there to kind of just help their own inner healing process. Um, and then after that eight hour period is over, they usually stay overnight. We go home, night attendant comes in, and then the following morning, immediately in the morning, we have an integration session. So 90 minutes of processing whatever comes up, usually what came up the day before. And then you have three integration sessions and then you do the dosing again. So it's sort of this alternation, alternating kind of this multi-level sandwich of, <laughs> of uh, prepara through preparation, dosing, through integration, dosing, through integration, um, et cetera. That's what the protocol looks like at this time. Understood. Kind of sucks for the placebo group. Because <laughs> yes. you know yes. right away, you're like, I didn't get the active. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, that is, is true sometimes and sometimes not. You know, some, we've, um, you would, it's sometimes the participants are fooled, sometimes we're fooled. Um, it, sometimes we have an active um, placebo or like a dose response study. So they're just getting different levels of it. So it's harder to tell. Um, but what we found in the MDMA work for PTSD is that they're still getting all of the psychotherapy. So um, you could think of it as uh, a lot of intensive therapy and people have their symptoms reduced. So people get better just from the therapy alone, not as much as with the MDMA. Um, another famous uh, psychedelic therapist and researcher, Bill Richards, he says, well, you know, just think about it as a spa day. And so it's like you get, you know, you get eight hours to lay back, enjoy music. You've got these two people there who are fully attending to you. Um, so that's another way to kind of think about the, a placebo. Do you, um, do you find that the participants, they are maybe more interested in this type of treatment because more of the traditional therapies weren't working for them? Absolutely. And that, and that is the case for both the research and for my the, the psychedelic integration work working just in the in private practice in the community. So it's actually really common for me to hear. I, and I think in some ways, you know, research is great for evaluating a new treatment, but it tends not to be so great when it comes to what we call um, a, a, a being representative of real of people who are out in the real world, mm -hmm. right? Because it's selective. We kind of are choosing certain people to enroll. So in private practice, it's very common for me to hear people say, you know, I've tried everything and nothing else has helped. Um, now that itself is something that we need to be wary of in the sense of how is the person's depression maybe or their worldview affecting that view of themselves. But I think it also speaks to a reality there that um, many of our treatments are insufficient in addressing the issues that people are coming in with. Mm -hmm. So before we get to that, and I think that that's a fascinating topic, is I'd like to discuss a little bit about the physiological effects of, of these um, psychedelics. I, I think, you know, we kind of have this cultural idea that, oh, you take something like this and then you start tripping balls. So mm. what actually happens, you know, whether that's MDMA or, you know, I, I think LSD, and, and obviously some of these molecules are a little bit different, but, you know, internally and physiologically, what is actually going on and how does that um, how does that have a profound impact on these uh, on these indications? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a great question, and and I guess the short answer is we don't know exactly. So, <laughs> we, no, really. We, well, well the, I mean, so what you're asking about is you're asking a mechanism of action question. How does it work? And I also hear you kind of asking, um, particularly pointing to biology um, rather than say psychology, although they're kind of intertwined, and. Um, so maybe we could talk a little, we could narrow it down to the serotonergic hallucinogens just because that removes MDMA, which is different. Um, and then, so in terms of the brain, well, there, there are people who are looking at different uh, areas of the brain to see what might be affected. Um, so given their name, they work primarily through serotonin. Uh, so, uh, however, there's also kind of a cascading effect in the, in the brain, which is a, I'm not a neuroscientist, so this is a little bit kind of above my level of knowledge, but uh, it's, it's not sufficient to just say, oh, it just works on serotonin. It works on actually quite a lot of different neurotransmitters, but the primary action is through serotonin. Currently, one way to answer that question, uh, right now, there's a lot of interest in 
this construct of the default mode network. Is that something that you've talked about on your show at all? or has We have not. Oh, we're familiar with it, but have not discussed it on the show. I'm actually not familiar. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, researchers came across this. Uh, well, what it means is that there are certain areas of the brain that are working in tandem together. When a person is um, doing something, um, more precisely, um, there's something called the task activated network. And so that's when you are engaged in a particular kind of task, say solving a math problem, your brain will light up in a particular kind of way. The default mode network is kind of the opposite of that. And so researchers came across this when they had people in brain scans and in between asking the participants in these brain scan studies to engage in some task, they were just resting. And what the researchers noticed was when these people were at rest, there was a certain uh, pattern of brain activity, the default mode network. And upon further investigation, they began to notice that when people are engaged in certain, because you're never not doing anything, to say that you're not engaged in any activity <laughs> is um, not accurate, right? Because you're, you're thinking, you're reflecting, you're maybe um, bringing up memories. And so this kind of introspective type of behavior is connected with the default mode network. Now what psychedelics might be doing, there's the number of papers on this topic, particularly if anybody's out there interested in the work of Robin Carhart Harris, he talks quite a bit about this. And the idea is that psychedelics may be, or they've observed to alter uh, the default mode network. And so it changes the, and it kind of makes sense experientially. People are um, having a change in this interactivity of this default mode network, and they are kind of connecting um, there's more maybe emotional salience to uh, when they're reflecting on past memories. Um, there's another idea which could be used psychotherapeutically. Another idea is the, uh, around this concept of ego death. Sometimes in the um, kind of psychedelic community, people talk about this. This idea of the uh, where one's sense of self um, begins to actually diminish and potentially uh, disappear uh, uh, almost entirely for some period of time. And this is sometimes equated or being connect, connects to this idea of a mystical experience. So a lot of the research around this psilocybin in particular looks at um, this, this construct of the mystical experience, this idea of self-transcendence. And that may be connected to this idea of one's ego or sense of self kind of diminishing. And then having an, but there, but there's still being awareness. So it's not like a person is blacked out. And with this kind of perspective, people relate to themselves, their problems, the world, society, whatever that they may be reflecting on in a kind of, in a different way where um, they may be, maybe they're not so confined by their previous ways of experiencing or seeing things. So that's now, maybe, this... there's a, a biological, psychological link. Understood. Now, is this what you, um, you were talking about going inward recently mm. or, or previously? Is that, is that what that is? Yes. Uh, great connection. Yeah. So very much with the psilocybin research, um, I was talking about MDMA, but it, it's also applicable for the psilocybin research. And in fact, um, when I was talking about the MDMA therapy and what's that like, what that's like, and I had mentioned that in the session, there's interpersonal connection. We're engaging in a conversation a little bit that actually tends to be less the case with psilocybin. Because psilocybin, as you're pointing out, ha, um, has, um, there's this tendency for the mystical experience. Uh, a conversation with somebody while a person was on the psilocybin might actually interfere with their ability to go to that place that I described of the mystical experience or that ego loss. And so we, that is why we're encouraging them to go in and focus inward because we're, we think that it maximizes the likelihood of um, that kind of... Um, the kind of reflection. So in, on that context, I, I read one research paper and, and forgive me, this was a long time ago, but it was um, patients on, I think it was LSD or psilocybin and the brain scans, what the, what the neurologist noticed was that the people who were just coming out of this when they're looking at brain scans had scans very similar to those of infants. And I think what I, I recall, again, forgive me, because I'm I don't know if it's lack of coffee at this point, but what they, what they extrapolated from that was, is that once the ego goes away, we see the world without construct. And so then that mm -hmm. becomes the therapeutic mechanism of action is, is we're not bound by that ego 
you know, the ego-driven construct of, of our world, and we can kind of, you know, permeate beyond that. Um, is that, in, to a certain extent, kind of what we're seeing with this one? And then as we talk about, this is a two-part question, by the way, mm. as we talk about serotonin, how do these differ than some of your SSRI, you know, uh, things that were, you know, that doctors are just throwing out like M&Ms? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, so the first question, yeah, that's what I, you know, I, I maybe did not read that paper. I have not come across that uh, analogy. I think um, I thought where you're going to go with it is with uh, meditators, because there's also some sort of research that's looking at the, the same effect uh, that uh, psychedelics have on the default mode network, um, maybe also parallel to the effect of, of advanced meditators. But um, the analogy of the infant is a really beautiful one. Um, actually, Albert Hoffman, the person who synthesized LSD, would often talk about seeing the world uh, as like a child. Um, and I think uh, um, uh, phenomenologically, uh, people describe seeing the world as if they were uh, a child, seeing things for, new for the first time. And there's an interesting biological mechanism that I learned about once um, around, I think they're the NMDA receptors. So when you're, if you're sitting here, you're sitting here talking to me now, and if there were a glass in the back of, glass of water in the back of the room that fell over and it crashed and it shattered, you know, you, you, would, you would turn around, right? Because there's a, um, and that's, that is a process in your brain that's happening that kind of alerts you and brings your attention to something. And from one of these lectures that I attended now quite a while ago, they're talking about LSD's sort of implication in that. And so you could think about kind of that sense of um, awareness, that sense of interest and attention that you give to that, that glass that broke. But now that kind of action is kind of going on um, more frequently facilitated by the LSD to kind of maybe almost anything that you uh, put your attention to. And so it, that may kind of in some ways explain um, biologically this kind of seeing the world through the eyes of a, of a child. Everything has kind of new meaning or significance. Uh, SSRIs. So I just want to again preface that I'm a psychologist and not a medical doctor, and I don't want to be speaking out of my scope of practice. Um, we'll put the legal generally... disclaimer in the show notes. <laughs> okay. <good. laughs> um, well, SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and so what they do is they um, the mechanism is that they allow for more serotonin in the synaptic gap because the synap- the serotonin that's being released is not um, being taking back into the, into the, um, it was the neuron, I guess, preceding it. Um, but, um, with psychedelic, the serotonergic psychedelics, the mechanism is different. They're not necessarily, uh, blocking reuptake. Um, I, I believe that they are just because they, they look very, now this is maybe, I might be wrong here, but I think it's because they resemble serotonin molecularly. Uh, they're actually being, um, it, the, the compounds themselves are being taken up into the uh, into the neurons. Um, this is where my my neuroscience is a little bit weak, um, so forgive me there. But it's definitely a different me- a different action that's happening in the neurons. Um, maybe one thing I could say about SSRIs, though, and this is kind of very preliminary evidence, um, but what we people often are well, one harm reduction. Be careful about. C- com- combining SSRIs and um, psych- serotonin psychedelics because there could be a risk of something called serotonin syndrome. Mm-hmm. But um, what we've also been observing in the studies, I don't think this is published yet, um, it seems like that even when people are off the SSRIs and if you're participating in the research, we, t- we titrate you off of your medication to avoid the combined effect. But what we are beginning to maybe see is that for people who've taken SSRIs for a long time, for say many years, and then stop, even when the titration is okay, um, they tend to respond to a less intense degree to MDMA. And we're not exactly sure why. There's now kind of new research talking about how SSRIs affect the brain in a long-term way. It's not that they don't experience any benefit with the MDMA, but they tend to not have the same kind of um, robust of an effect. So that's a little kind of disclaimer right now about SSRIs. Interesting. Gotcha. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to extrapolate that uh, for our audiences. Don't take SSRIs. 
<laughs> well, I'm not. No, I know no, that I'm you're not, sure. not saying that. I'm <laughs> saying that. It, 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 you know, it's kind of funny. As uh, you know, I remember uh, at one point, you know, I was seeing a therapist, and and you know, they had. Uh, they had talked about that. And I remember asking a very scientific question of like, well, how does it work? And the response that I got from the physician at, the, at that point was, well, we think. And, and that's, a, that's a scary proposition when we start talking about pharmacological intervention with your brain. I mean, like it's different if it's, you know, I'm taking an Advil for, for you know, inflammatory response purposes, but, you know, long-term effects of these seem to be, you know, w without the proper research, seem to be a scary proposition. And one of the things that we talk about, and, and this kind of comes back to this mechanism of action, is bio-optimization and longevity. If we're, if we're supposed to live or if we're hoping to live beyond the typical U.S. life expectancy, there seems to be this idea that we need to almost have a cognitive reset every now and then. Um, and I think of Grumpy Old Men as a perfect example, one of my favorite movies, but you get to a point where our brains become so inflexible, so rigid, so patterned that anything that deviates from that pattern makes us grumpy old men. And so I've always liked this idea that psychedelics have this opportunity to be somewhat of a cognitive reset where we can, you know, strip away the ego, we can strip away some of those patterns that make us, you know, so rigid. And, and I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about that is if we were to look at a therapy intervention for psychedelics, is there a, a space for the person who's really looking for longevity to incorporate these in and maybe like an annual or biannual basis for something outside of depression or anxiety mm. or things like that? Jana Breslin here. As most of you know, I grew up playing sports, which required lots of intensive training. A couple years ago, I switched to CrossFit style workouts, and let's just say my body has taken an absolute beating over the years. I remember waking up after heavy workouts, barely being able to get out of bed. I always added fish oil to my daily regimen for overall wellness and to help combat the post-workout muscle soreness, but my joints and muscles would still be sore for days. I needed something more than just omega-3 fish oil. That's why I take complete human PRM response. This daily super supplement helps my body resolve inflammation quickly so I can live pain-free and keep training. I've been taking it for a while now and my workouts are better, my recovery is faster, and overall I just feel great. I know we all need a good omega-3 product and PRM response is the next generation in omega-3 supplementation with unique pre-resolving mediators that help resolve inflammation quickly so we can get back in the game of life. Head on over to store.completehuman.com to try it 20% off with the code PRM20. So welcome back to the Complete Human Podcast with Dr. I know it's the honorifics, but we're calling you doctor <laughs> anyway, Dr. Ingmar Gorman, where we're talking about all things psychedelic. And I think we were, were we in the middle of a question or did we? I think we were. I think we were in the SSRI section, right? Or Yeah, I, I can pick it up for where we, okay. where we left off. Okay, great. Um, so one thing I, I was just wrapping up around SSRIs and how they can be helpful for some people. And then I was transitioning into, you know, how, how traditional psychopharmacology is kind of different in its way it works from psychedelics in the sense that what traditional psychopharmacology tends to do is to kind of blunt symptoms. Whereas what we might be seeing with psychedelics in some cases is actually kind of going into and maybe even bringing up some of the difficult stuff that contributes to symptoms. And so, um, so maybe to, let's see where to go from here. Um, so almost well, like in, in, mm -hmm. it's not a band-aid effect, which the SSRIs might be more of a band-aid effect than these psychedelics. Yes. I mean, I, I, hes I hesitate a little bit because I want to agree with you and I want to be mm -hmm. also be cautious as somebody who's working in a study under the FDA to not sort of make claims that we don't know. But right. I think that's how people like to think about psychedelics, that they the, the phrase people say is that maybe it goes to the root of something rather than just sort of putting a Band-Aid on something. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, it's interesting as a question, because you had, uh, uh, Evan, you had mentioned kind of uh, this critique of SSRIs. And often psychedelics are thought of as a, like, um, not a first line treatment, but a later treatment. Sort of like, let's see, um, let's see if these other things work. And then us like the psychedelics are left last. Understandably, it comes from uh, a history of a lot of controversy and, and potential perceived risk. And so the idea is, let's not do something risky unless it's the, the very um, last thing. And that's why you might see studies with treatment resistant PTSD or uh, anxiety in people who have a terminal diagnosis, right? Because we're kind of working at the outer edges and now we're kind of looking and in, going into more of the, the middle. Um, and so the reason why it might be a 
potentially, again, if all the science pans out of good first line treatment is because the people are re receiving these compounds one, two, or three times, rather than something that they're taking on a daily basis, like an SSRI, which, you know, comes back to your point around optimization, right, in the body, right? Do we, um, we want to optimize our health, we want to optimize our mental health, but I think we want to do that in a way which um, isn't um, making us, I don't want to say dependent, but, you know, bringing an exogenous, some sort of chemical or something that's outside of ourselves and continuing to reintroduce it into our body, our body will adapt to that external uh, source or, or drug. And so I think we want to be really careful around that. And so in that way, maybe psychedelics could be really helpful because they don't do that as much. Your, your last question was around, I think what you were, you were asking about was what about kind of psychedelics is helpful for people who are well, people who don't necessarily meet the criteria for a DSM diagnosis. And I think that that's kind of maybe the research that we'll be in, anticipating uh, in the future. Right, um, because well, I think whether you meet criteria for a DSM diagnosis or not, people are under a lot of stress. People are uh, often maybe not clinically depressed, but they're. I mean, particularly during these times of COVID, it's extremely stressful in people's lives. Uh, and um, just like going to an intensive meditation retreat uh, or another kind of practice, which helps people optimize their wellness maybe psychedelics will be there one day in the future. And what we see is that generally uh, you have, pe there are definitely people who are advocating for such things uh, around microdosing for creativity or for mindfulness. Uh, there are definitely anecdotally people talk about the benefits. The research isn't quite there yet. Um, although there are research studies looking at, uh, published already looking at psychedelics in um, people who have an in, intense meditation practice. Uh, there are some past studies looking at creativity. Um, so there are some, or healthy individuals in, who are volunteers looking at how MDMA impacts uh, a sense of social connection, a uh, sense of well being. Um, so social the preliminary. What's that? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and these days, who knows anymore? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that there's definitely a possible future there, but we're not, we're, right now we're looking at the medical potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the things that you, you did bring up uh, was that, you know, these psychedelics being used as a last line of defense uh, mm -hmm. against some of these things. Now, how is that going to impact your research if someone has been on these SSRIs to treat PTSD, depression? And then from what you're seeing is, is that you're titrating them down, but there is a lack or a diminished efficacy of psychedelics. Um, are you starting to see that in the research? And, and then how do you account for that when you're, when you're recruiting, you know, you have your SSRI group as well as your non-SSRI group? Yes. Well, so um, the, the, that statement that I made about SSRIs in particular comes from research. So it's not just something that I'm saying anecdotally. It's something that we've kind of quantitatively examined. I don't know if that this data is published yet. And so, you know, just the caveat being like, maybe we did something wrong in the study. Maybe there's an alternative explanation, right? With science, we always have to be open-minded around our explanation. But if, if, it's, um, if it's valid that the SSRIs were responsible for what we saw, it's not that they didn't benefit. It's just they didn't, they didn't have as, they had a significant, so speaking statistically, uh, they had a statistically significant decrease in their PTSD symptoms, but their decrease was not, uh, um, was, not as st was statistically significant and not as great as the non SSRI group, the group that never had um, SSRIs. So it doesn't mean that they can't benefit, but um, I mean, I guess it's a, a, an area for further research. I mean, maybe there's some period of time that people have to be off of the SSRIs for um, the for some regenerative process. Maybe there's another compound out there that might be combined with the MDMA to, you know, we, this is all. Uh, Skept, um, you know, um, uh, unclear, but maybe in the future we'll, we'll figure out some more. This is, again, very cutting edge kind of information. So when we talk about that, then one of the things that we've come to recognize, especially in looking at new and novel treatments, is that the standard of care implementation, especially in the medical community, runs about 17 years. So once something mm -hmm. kind of goes from that FDA approval, you know, then you've got the integration platform. And so, you know, we're looking at potentially over a decade before this becomes standard of care. 
Um, that being said, I mean, have you heard that? And then subsequently, you know, if, if you guys come up with this research and we see legislative change in the immediate future, it conceivably could be a long time before we're actually starting to see this in, in practice therapy, right? Yeah, big question here. Well, so one thing is that the FDA did uh, grant um, um, breakthrough, uh, breakthrough, not access, uh, breakthrough, it's a breakthrough designation. So there was some, a little bit of, um, uh, so in order to get this designation, you have to be treating uh, a, a disorder that is life-threatening. So in this case, it was PTSD. Um, and that for the the, the drug that you're studying or the treatment that you're studying to have the potential to be equal to or better than what the treatments that are available out there. And so MDMA received this for, for the treatment of PTSD. Psilocybin received this for the treatment of uh, treatment-resistant depression. Um, that being said, uh, you're right. It still takes time for this research to conclude. We are expecting MDMA phase three to be done sometime around 2022 or 2023. Um, and that's when that's when the there's a review process by the FDA and then presumably at some point around then uh, MDMA could be a prescribable medicine. Uh, I think the barrier, I mean, there's so much, maybe I should also say that there, there's so much interest in this, these treatments, right? So when we're recruiting for, just as an example, when we're recruiting for participants uh, in our research, usually a scientist who starts a new uh, study has to put extensive amounts of effort into recruitment, right? Here we, we open, we uh, publicized that our, our site was open and we had hundreds of people who wanted to participate uh, within the matter of a few hours. So I think the demand is enormous. Uh, the question then comes to access. And I think there, that's the biggest challenge, not necessarily from a regulatory perspective, but how do you make this, and everybody's racking their head around this, how do you make this treatment affordable and accessible? One, um, you know, you can't scale it as well as a SSRI because you can produce thousands of pills and hand them out, right? And that prescribe them. I shouldn't say hand out, <laughs> but with, <laughs> but with, uh, with um, MDMA, it's, it's the, and with psilocybin, it's the drug therapy combination. And so the, then what is the problem to scale is actually the people. How do you train the therapists to um, at, at enough pace to be able to disseminate the treatment? That's where my company, company Fluence comes in because we are um, kind of lining ourselves up to be a training site for people who are going to do these therapies. Um, but the other barrier to access is affordability, because if you have two therapists uh, in the session with you and you have something like, if uh, the calculation is somewhere around something like 60 hours, like paid therapist time, you're talking about a treatment that can be costing it ten, tens of thousands of dollars. And you know, if, if, if it's a cure, and this is where insurance becomes really important, right? Because we don't want to make this, we don't want to make a treatment that most people can't access. That's r ridiculous. Um, particularly people who've been traumatized or people who need it the most um, can often be the people who can't afford it. And so this is where insurance comes in. And we know that the economically, and this is what um, the United States tends not to be very good at, <laughs> is, is, is comparing the short-term cost and long-term cost. Short-term, yes, it's say ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. But what we know about PTSD is that in terms of the healthcare economics, when it comes to the utilization of uh, ERs for all sorts of um, physiological symptoms that are related and unrelated to the trauma, uh, the expense that they cost the, uh, to the system is is multiple times more than the cost of this treatment. And if we could, if we if we are potentially curing people, economically it could make sense. But it it really need it relies on these large institutions and these systems to realize, okay, the, the a large short term cost to cover somebody's access to the MDMA treatment in the long run is going to save them a lot of money. But they have to be thinking in that way um, for that to happen. So this is. This is definitely not a solved problem. We're encountering it now and we're trying to figure out how we can make this accessible to people. Well, I remember uh, in How to Change Your Mind, they were talking about the success rate of, I think it was LSD in getting people to quit smoking. And it was something like 
orders of magnitude greater than anything else that we've come up with, like 60 or 70%. So, I mean, you know, from that standpoint, the economic factors say that if you could get someone to quit smoking, what does that do for decreasing medical costs down the road after emphysema or mm -hmm. lung cancer, all of those things, you know, kick in. So, you know, clearly there's the economic piece. Um, one question though, where's this stuff made? So, so I mean, cause there's also, there's, there's the insurance economics, but then yeah. Pharma loves to get their hands on things like this. So is this a pharmaceutical uh, company's wet dream or is this because there's not a there's not a, a not, daily dose that people are like, ah, you know, it's not that big of a deal. One thing I just want to make a plug. So it was, it was not LSD, it was psilocybin and it, for the smoking cessation. And that's Matthew Johnson's research out of Johns Hopkins. Um, fantastic uh, research. Yeah, really powerful when it comes to smoking cessation. So it's a really hard, hard drug to stop uh, nicotine smoking. Um, to your question, well, I think you, you kind of said it, right? It's not a drug that a person takes on a daily basis. So pharmaceutical industries, gen, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, for, for, for whatever, whatever that is, is not really interested in this so much. Um, because they're not potentially could be a cure. Well, you know, this is, this is no, interesting. Those are my right? because, words, not yours. No, 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 no. Well, no, no, even, even let's, let's take that as a, a, let's say that it is a cure as an assumption. Um, what I was sort of reacting to was that there are, what is, like, the question is, what is, what is the view of the pharmaceutical industry? And um, I kind of take the view, maybe naively, that, um, well, they, they maybe see what's happening, and they're definitely not getting in the way, at least not at this point, there's some people who think like, well, this is going to potentially cut into their profits. They're going to try to do something to get in the way of this research. I think that's a little bit conspiratorial, but I don't, maybe, but that's not my view. Um, well, but, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, just to, uh, I come from, you know, I come from a dietary supplement space and, and I look at, you know, historically the red yeast rice lavazostatin, uh, you know, lawsuit. And so this was probably, I believe, in the 90s where red yeast rice became very popular at Whole Foods. And the reason that it did is because it had a natural lavazostatin in it, which could help lower cholesterol. And so like so many of our pharmaceutical drugs, they're derived from natural compounds or they're synthesized originally from natural compounds. And so once these dietary supplement companies started pitching red yeast rice as this natural compound, very similar to what we're seeing in the CBD world is CBD is mm -hmm. a natural constituent part of, of hemp. Um, the pharmaceutical industry said, no, 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 you know, statins are our product. You can't claim that, you know, mm. they went to court and I'll, I'll give you one guess on who won in that one. So I, wow. I think as we start to look at, there is a historical trend where pharmaceuticals could say, you start encroaching on our cash cows, which, you know, Prozac, any of, you know, Wellbutrin, any of these as daily products covered by insurance have, are, are big cash cows for them. I don't think it's conspiratorial. I think that there's a real... Uh, conversation to be had about where does pharmaceuticals, you know, fall on on these psychedelics as true yeah. inventions. Well, one place where that might happen is the the insurance companies may say, well, our contracts with these pharmaceutical companies are more valuable to us. We're not going to insure your um, your treatment because we don't want to upset the other pharmaceutical company. So, so the FDA I, could approve it, but then insurance won't cover it. Right. You could, exactly. You could have you could have a treatment that that is not that's difficult to access. Yeah. Um, in terms of where the drugs come from, though, just to answer that question, it's it's not. Um, there are many sort of minor con contractual based pharma labs that make what's something called GMP, which is good manufacturing practice compounds. And so, um, for phase three research, sort of the last stage, you need to have, um, say, MDMA that is in a blister pack. It meets a very very high level of purity. Basically, that it's that it's it's at the point at which it could go to market. Uh, for phase two research, there, uh, there's a less strict um, you know, process around creating the, the MDMA or synthesized psilocybin. Um, so it, it's, it's not like we're going to Pfizer and asking them to develop psilocybin or MDMA for us. It's, it, that's, not the, that's not the challenge or the barrier. Although it's very expensive to develop GMP uh, drugs because of all of the all that goes into that process. So I, I think um, then as we talk about that, I, I'd like to transition a little bit into, you know, our our listeners' understanding of psychedelics. You know, more and more people are trying to get into this. You know, more and more people are understanding that the the value of it. So how does someone who's very interested in psychedelics for true therapeutic benefit? 
go about that? Is there a path forward in the United States or are we subject to, to getting on a plane and going to Costa Rica for ayahuasca or Peru for some of these? You know, it's, um, yeah, that's, that's really what it boils down to. Can people, do people have access now or are we waiting? Um, I think the, 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 uh, the answer mostly would be that we're waiting. So the, the exceptions being, um, there is an interest in ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And so ketamine is uh, not a ser- classic psychedelic. It's um, sometimes people refer to it as a psychedelic a dissociative. Um, it is, a, it's safe. It's, in many ways it's safe. It's in some ways it may be even safer than the classic psychedelics I'm gonna compare that. Um, but um, <laughs> it's, it's used uh, in ERs um, all over the world, the WHO considers it to be like one of the necessary medications that every country needs to have. Um, but there's a certain dosage level or a certain route of administration that can produce psychedelic-like effects. And there are people, and, and it's schedule three, I believe. So it can be prescribed off-label and there are psychiatrists and therapists who are using ketamine to enhance psychotherapy. And um, they're saying with good effect. Um, you may know of ketamine uh, as a treatment for depression. And usually when people access it through a ketamine clinic, it's not with psychotherapy. It's just a very biological kind of approach, meaning that you sit there, you get an infusion of ketamine. Um, some people have psychedelic experiences on it. Some people just feel kind of fuzzy. And there generally is an antidepressant effect that's observed um, sometimes several days, sometimes for several weeks. In some uh, rare cases, uh, months to, to years. Um, and there's research out there that has been published that looks that looked at um, co- um, cognitive behavioral therapy and ketamine versus just ketamine alone. And they found that the psychotherapy helped uh, prolong the, the benefits. And so that is sort of one place where psychedelic therapy is available, but we don't know if it's It clearly is pretty good for depression, but we don't know how effective it is for PTSD. I mean, there's some initial evidence around PTSD and OCD, um, but I don't think the the evidence is robust enough at this moment. So that's right now what people are doing to kind of access something like psychedelic therapy, but it's a different compound and it works in a different way. Some people are electing to travel abroad. Um, You know, in my private practice and in the way that I educate, I tend, I, I really, If somebody came to me and said that they want to go to Peru to have an ayahuasca experience, I would kind of work with them to help them evaluate that decision to see if that's best for them. If they say, no, 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 I'm definitely set on doing this, then I would help them kind of evaluate maybe the uh, retreat that they're going to, kind of help them set their intention, kind of prepare them for what, what might come afterwards and help them, again, minimize the harms and maximize the benefits. But one thing that I don't do is I don't I don't recommend retreats. And this is sort of my, my kind of um, public service announcement here is that uh, there isn't really any kind of oversight over these retreats. And also just because uh, something like ayahuasca or psilocybin might be legal outside of this country, it doesn't necessarily make it a medical treatment in that place. And so um, there's all sorts of kind of risks that a person takes when they decide to do that. Again, that, that when they're risk benefit, maybe that's, the best thing for them. But um, as a psychologist, I have to be careful in saying like, oh yeah, you should definitely go to so-and-so retreat. It's great. I heard, you know, uh, because these, these, the quality of these retreats can fluctuate over time. And again, there isn't really any oversight around it. What's the, what's the harm uh, in, you know, I, I think that we, we talked about the, uh, the side effects of some of these, you know, what are, what are some of the potential downsides of psychedelic intervention? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. And that's, it, it connects to what I had mentioned around how psychedelics might work differently from traditional medication and that it kind of, you kind of go into or you kind of bring stuff up. Um, and so if you kind of accept that hypothesis, um, what I tend to see a lot in my private practice is, are people who've been really dissociating from their, their feelings. Like they, they've had to adapt to the environment that they grew up in. And say it was a really noxious environment, maybe there's a lot of abuse or trauma. And what, the way that some people cope completely understandably is that they kind of 
they uh, just sort of push that down. So to, to speak metaphorically, just to like kind of not feel it. And then they can kind of get, get by in the world. And what psychedelics might be doing is that the healing process is partly by kind of opening up those wounds and looking at them. And when people are reaching out to me for help, usually what has happened is that they've had a psych, uh, an intense psychedelic experience. They're feeling anxiety or having panic attacks or feeling depressed or um, having trouble sleeping. Those are common uh, experiences for those people who, for whom this happens. Um, what's another one? Um, sometimes people, I've had a number of people say that they've cured their depression and now they're anxious. Like they've never felt anxious in the, the, their whole life because they've just always been sort of low energy, kind of sunken down, depressed. Now they're actually feeling hopeful about the world, but they're now they're maybe it's because they're future oriented <laughs> and now they're anxious. Mm -hmm. So th they're, they're all of these like, you know, unexpected uh, consequences of going through this healing process. That's not about numbing, but about kind of bringing up. And not everybody is ready for that. Nobody, not everybody wants that. I think that's one of the hard, that's one of the real, that should be on that commercial that you were talking about, right? The commercial for psychedelics, like, you know, on your way to getting better, you might feel a little bit worse. And that doesn't mean that you fried your brain like that egg on the, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know commercial, but it means that, um, you know, now you're feeling all of the stuff that you've pushed down for a long time. And we're going to kind of have to, we're going to support you through therapy through this process. Um, and it's unfortunate that when people sometimes hear about psychedelics as a panacea or this thing that is curative, they're often not informed about this part of it, which is the, the kind of the road that you kind of have to go down sometimes to get to that place of feeling better. You know, I, I think we talked about that in our ayahuasca mm -hmm. podcast, but it, in my mind, it's advanced medicine. It's, you know, you have to work to, to get the results. And, and unlike the SSRIs, and again, I'm, we're not here to bash on them, but it is more of a you take that pill and the pill does the work. Whereas the ayahuasca experience or psychedelic experience is like, you have to work to get the full benefit. And, and so that advanced element of it makes it more of a, I, I think it, it narrows the scope of people who are willing to do that. Right. Cause it is bringing up mm -hmm. the stuff mm -hmm. you're having to face some of your issues. You're having to work through them. And maybe it, it's a great opportunity to do that in a safe place, especially with the, you know, the appropriate therapist, but yeah, well, it, I think so many people think like, okay, if I want to feel better, like what can I take to relieve myself of this pain or discomfort or emotional turmoil when it seems like with these compounds, it's more getting to the root and, and bringing all this stuff to surface and dealing with healing from it in that, in that sense, instead of burying it down, it is more kind of surfacing and not a lot of people want to sign up for that. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, that's one of my concerns when it comes to the idea of, I mean, it's interesting that word prescribe when I, I, my thinking of that word means like you are kind of, how would you put that in other language? Like you're not recommending, but you're kind of saying this is what you should do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, whereas kind of traditionally, when I think about psychedelics, I think of it as something that people are kind of, this is a little bit woo woo, but they're called to. Mm -hmm. where you have a, and, I, and I think that that's like, there's something valuable in that, right? That a person is seeking out this experience. They know that it might be difficult for them, but they're, they're sort of a commitment to the process. Whereas somebody who just has some sort of diagnosis, who doesn't know about all of this and who's prescribed it, their relationship going into the experience and their expectation might be very different. And since we know about set and setting, the mindset actually is, is intricately connected to how the the psychedelic works and the, the outcome that a person is going to have. Well, and it's, it's funny you bring that up, Ingmar, is, is, you know, when it came to our ayahuasca experience in Peru, we both said, it's like, we're called to this. You know, it wasn't that we're going to go, you know, we're going to go have an ayahuasca in Peru is, it was, no, it's like, we, we knew that what we were getting into um, our experience and what led up to our experience might not have been ideal. And we probably should have talked to you beforehand, but uh, you know, hindsight. <laughs> Um, so before we get, you know, but before we move on, I think one other question that I have is, is there's obviously the, there's the potential for harm based off of a person's experience or their expectation going in. There's a, there's the potential for, shall we say some negative experience, but is there anything from a biological perspective that could be considered negative about some of these, uh, interventions? Um, I mean, I think aside from the some of the physiological stuff around, I said around heart rate, I think we need to be careful around, this is more psychological, but it's all biological and mm -hmm. psychological. But I think, you know, people who, to speak vaguely or broadly maybe around this, I, and I like to sometimes think about people who are kind of rigid 
uh, and neurotic, sort of um, maybe like you and me. <laughs> uh, and then there's some people who are already in the world who are kind of already very open. And, um, you know, maybe we might think about uh, the, a diagnosis of something like uh, a psychotic like disorder, right? Where they're already kind of interpreting the world through a different lens. And it's possible, again, this is all a metaphor, but by kind of opening people up further through a psychedelic experience, it's maybe de more destabilizing for them. So that's, um, that's one way to look at things. Um, recently, this I don't know if there's any, um, this is totally anecdotal based off of my own observation, but I've had a number of people come out of uh, particularly ayahuasca experiences describing um, a kind of unsettling sense of dissociation. Um, and, I, and I know that part of this uh, ayahuasca experience can be a sense of even more so than with maybe uh, psilocybin, a kind of... Um, it's, it's almost like a deeply meditative state where a person is kind of aware of themselves and they're, they're, there's a, this, a, just a greater capacity for mindfulness. That's the best way I can describe it. A greater a state of mindfulness. And I found that several people who I've worked with after ayahuasca um, kind of find that, that experience of um, kind of observing themselves or being kind of self-aware to be... Um, unpleasant and almost like too dissociative. And I wonder if there's a, something going on there biologically, maybe with the default node network that somehow um, it gets lodged in a way that they are feeling slightly dissociated after experience. This is very anecdotal. I don't know what the evidence is for this, but that could be an effect. Um, biologically, let's see here. Um, the reason I asked no, that, uh, the, tell me. I had this really good friend in elementary school and we got to high school and he kind of went his own direction and, and, you know, ended up, uh, you know, in a little bit more counterculture type of, uh, you know, kid, you know, found Pink Floyd and, and uh, you know, eventually found some LSD. And the urban myth was that he started dealing acid. Mm. And at one point he shows up with like, a, apparently it was on sheets, uh, you know, it was like a drug bust or something. The cops caught him. He, he shoves the sheets of acid down his pants and takes off running. And, you know, gets a quarter mile away, all of the acid absorbs into his system. Um, and, and I think that there's probably an urban legend in most places, you know, about something like this. And then apparently he just stops and starts singing, I'm a little teapot and has been somewhat vegetative ever since. Mm. So there's, I don't know if these are the, you know, the Nancy Reagan cautionary tales about some of these drugs is that, you know, you could do, you know, Meaning permanently, permanently, he was you know, changed. messed up your brain. Mm -hmm. um, everything that we saw on how to change your mind, everything that we've seen in the research seems to indicate that that's not the case, but, you know, really looking at like MDMA, you know, ketamine, psilocybin, LSD, is there any potential for a, you know, a cataclysmic shift in the brain that could cause, you know, something more permanent that people should be aware of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, generally the way that I think about this is through, um, so, um, so for, let's, let's look at this. So there's a study, uh, published an uh, epidemiological study looking at psychedelic use amongst the general population. And when th they found uh, that, and again, there's limitations to those kinds of study designs, but what they found was uh, that there were no mental health deficits on a population level when it came to psychedelic use. Um, in fact, there was uh, a decrease in uh, likelihood of suicidal, I, I believe of suicidal ideation um, than in uh, people who don't use psychedelics. Um, now, in terms of the, the, so what you're kind of speaking to is a psychotic break or a psychotic state, right? And so Correct, yeah. there is, um, so there was a fear that psychedelics make you go crazy. So like if you take, you know, LSD a certain amount of times, then you're going to be clinically insane or, or some, something like that. Um, generally, what we would then observe if that were true is that, again, on a population level, uh, the rates of psychosis or schizophrenia um, does not uh, st is is uh, flat over many decades. It stays the same, whereas uh, rates of different psychedelic use changes. Uh, uh, you know, there are trends. Sometimes it's ups and sometimes it's down. And what you would expect if there was a correlation, well, you would expect those to be correlated. And so far, we don't see that. I think the danger is where. Um, so we talk about uh, a period of vulnerability for, for young men and young women, somewhere around the ages of 18, 17 to like, you know, the 
late 20s, I think mid 30s for men, there's a window where if a person has a propensity for schizophrenia, maybe the genetic predisposition for it, or maybe it's some sort of environmental predisposition or a combination, that the psychedelic experience due to its intensity would be a catalyst that then contributes to the psychotic break. So the idea is that perhaps this individual would have been schizophrenic otherwise, maybe um, it would have just been a different trigger and maybe these, these intense psychedelic experiences are triggers for certain people who are vulnerable. And for that reason, um, such people who um, uh, have a close relative with this diagnosis uh, tend to be excluded from these studies because we wanna be extra careful. Um, that being said, there's some people in the psychedelic research world who are thinking about the potential for say MDMA as, as a treatment for some aspect of schizophrenia. Again, I don't, I don't know very much, it's not even, the study's not happening yet. It was a proposal. I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, but generally, really, the kind of harm reduction piece here is that if you have a history of psychosis or if you have somebody close to you who has, has a history of psychosis, it's something that you should probably be very, very careful about. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that. I think, you know, it, we hear a lot about the benefits, but, uh, you know, we certainly want to, as people are listening to this and contemplating, you know, whether it's their ayahuasca experience in Peru or Costa Rica, you know, or some type of clinical, uh, you know, opportunity to experience these is, you know, what are, what are the, what are the pros and what are the cons? And it, it doesn't seem like the cons yeah. list is big, but they're still there. And, you know, respectfully, we need to make people aware that everything is a risk reward for everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really, I'm glad you're bringing that up. And I think that um, maybe the biggest, so, so other things that stand out to me are just, well, the fact that's black market, right. That we don't have some official way to, um, see the uh, the quality of and the, and whether it is what you you hope it is in terms of the drug, although um, test kits there are reagent test kits that you can get off of websites like Dance Safe and others where you can test your own drug to see what's in it. Um, there's a, again a harm reduction uh, kind of plug here, uh, but the other concern or just not the the black market is also um, the, the the variations in set and setting right so. Um, you know, there are very, um, there are well-meaning people who want to say be psychedelic therapists or people who aren't trained in psychotherapy who uh, might have their own ideas of what is sort of part of the healing process who can unwittingly do harm to people. Um, you know, I know of a case that's really unfortunate where a person was seeking out underground psychedelic therapy, found somebody um, and then that person turned out to be basically belonging to some like a cult and was like, got the, got this person into a psychedelic state and then asked, was making them engage in all sort of like ritualistic. Uh, and I'm not talking about indigenous shamanism. I mean, I'm talking about mm -hmm. kind of really weird, like, uh, I don't know how to say this up pejoratively, but, but basically things that weren't in, weren't honoring the person's healing process, but more about indoctrinating them into some other mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. So that's, Ingmar, we don't have a PG that. rating. So if there's something you need to say, <laughs> okay. go for it. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, it did make me really angry. I'll put it that way. And I yeah. might've used some curse words with some, some mm -hmm. colleagues about this. I mean, that's really sad. Yeah. So uh, the, the lesson from that is, is that if you are going to buy black markets, uh, you know, psychedelics is make sure you ask your drug dealer for a GMP certification. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Show them, you know, they need to show you the certificate. Yeah. So to bring this back to Fluence, so what Fluence does is help educate and teach licensed professionals on, I would love for you to explain more about what yeah. Fluence does and how it helps there. Absolutely. So uh, one thing to just say uh, and put it to the side is that, you know, we hope to one day train psychedelic assisted therapists. So we want to train people to be able to give psilocybin, to give MDMA, for them to do it legally. And the reason why we're not doing that now is kind of, is a little bit complicated, but basically what, would, what we would do is if we, if we were to advertise that we're training psychedelic therapists, then uh, they would get our training, but then they couldn't do it because there's no way to legally do that in the United right. States. And we only want to train people when they're actually going to be able to use what we're teaching. Mm -hmm. So that being said, what, what we are training right now is in something called psychedelic integration therapy. And that, is, um, and that came about because we observed that there are many people like yourselves who have psychedelic experiences, but who will go to psychology today or whatever website or to find, or their, their current therapist, 
They find a therapist and they say, oh, you know, well, I did ayahuasca last week and it was the most meaningful experience of my life, or I'm struggling with this. I realized that. And uh, the therapist will generally give you a completely blank stare because they have no idea <laughs> what you're talking about. Um, they just don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, and so that's where fluence comes in. You know, we want to train, we are training. We've trained over 600 uh, medical and mental health providers about psychedelics. And so um, that means that these people can now be helpful in helping a person after their psychedelic experience. These professionals can help their clients or they can help their clients prepare or uh, engage in uh, uh, motivational interviewing or, or um, kind of dealing with the ambivalence or their excitement or identifying contraindications. I mean, it's, when you get into it, it's actually really beautiful and really complex. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and we do this by, we have a two day workshop that we, we call Psychedelics 101, 102. Uh, and so people can attend that. That's, it's open to everybody. We generally, again, want to be working with professionals because we want to like replicate ourselves so other people can do this work, but we accept right. anybody. Uh, we just launched a certificate program, which is like a 120 hour certificate. That's a year long process where um, people take reading groups. There's a consultation group. So that's where professionals, mental health therapists, they present a case and they get feedback from the group. Um, it's a consultation. Uh, so we're just continuing to offer new kinds of courses. All of this is live. We don't do anything pre-recorded where you kind of just sit there and watch it. It's all live interaction with people who are researchers in the field. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, and you might know one thing that we do is uh, we have a experiential, that's all online. The one thing that's in person is an experiential retreat at Menla, which I don't know if you know, um, it's like the Tibet, Tibet house is um, a Buddhist retreat up in upstate New York. It's really amazing. Um, uh, Robert Thurman uh, is, uh, I think like, it's, it's his, I think, it, I don't, I hope this is correct that this is his retreat or he's a faculty member there. Uh, and so we spend a week there engaging in contemplative practices to induce non-ordinary states. And then the therapists engage with each other around their experiences so that they can kind of have a, a more um, direct connection to this work rather than just doing it and learning about it in an arbitrary way. Mm. Wonderful. So yeah. I, I think we're almost out of time here, but I, I, I kind of a follow up to that. I'm curious about how places like Berkeley or the proposed, you know, Oregon just decriminalizing, you know, psilocybin mm. and all of these, does that impact your mission? Does that open you guys up for the opportunity to coach, uh, you know, therapists or mental health professionals to do this work prior to a federal uh, deregulation of the, of the schedule one? Yeah. I mean, I think I wish somebody would reach out to us to, um, you know, from the state, or some um, body for us to be able to provide that education because I think it would reduce a ton of harm for us to kind of educate the, the local communities there before these legislative changes. Um, so I think that, and, and there are, I mean, in October 3rd and 4th, we ha um, have a nearly sold out uh, workshop for Psychedelics 101, 102 in Portland. And so it's very much um, connected to, uh, and some of the people who are attending that workshop are connected to the, those, those, uh, those efforts there. Um, one thing that I will say, as again, another PSA, is uh, there's a, every, every situation uh, in every city or state is very nuanced and different. And often people use the word decriminalization as a blanket term, but it, it, there's a lot, again, a lot of um, specifics to it. So for example, um, well, ideally decriminalization would mean that there is no criminal penalty for ha holding say psilocybin mushrooms. But what you see, and I think this is the case for Oakland, it, it's not necessarily decriminalized. My understanding is that it's deprioritized. So that means that the, the police uh, don't have it very high on their priority list in terms of the resources that they're putting into catching people with psilocybin mushrooms. But that's different from it not being um, a criminal, um, uh, something that's punishable, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, and it also definitely decriminalized, even if it were truly decriminalized, it doesn't it doesn't make it a, uh, a bona fide uh, prescribable treatment. Mm -hmm. So people think, oh, it's decriminalized. Great. I'll be able to get psilocybin therapy for, but no, 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 no. Like there's, that's not what it is. So 
please, if you are kind of following this and you're interested in it, um, please do pay attention to the details. I really wouldn't want anybody to get in trouble um, because they misinterpreted. I mean, the, the media doesn't do a really great job of communicating these points sometimes. Um, not talking no, to you. No, they don't. And, and I think the PSA yeah. on top of that is that, yeah. you know, obviously we don't want therapists to, to, you know, not understand, fully understand the context of the law and then start, you know, offering these as, as interventions and then end up losing their license. So, you know, interestingly enough, we do have a lot of medical professionals who follow our show. And, and I think, you know, uh, my PSA is as we seem to be turning a corner on the legal side of things where you have, you know, Colorado, you have Oakland, you know, w whatever the legal architectural framework is about the law, you know, the wording for these products is our job now is to not, pardon my French, it's not, it's to not fuck it up. It's, you know, like, yeah. you know, in a lot of ways, I, I think, you know, these small, these small changes in the law are like a kid getting his parents credit card for the first time and just going, you know, hog wild. And so it's, you know, it, it's still to follow protocols. It's still to implement, you know, safety procedures. It's still to do things right and not just, you know, all of a sudden make these, you know, these municipalities regret the decision to decriminalize this because people are going nuts with, you know, with psychedelics. So, mm -hmm. you know, our yeah. goal in all of this is to recognize that there is a, a huge potential for therapy with these and to support those efforts through fluence, through, you know, through all of the you know, approved and appropriate channels to make sure that this becomes a long-term benefit for people, not just a short-term, you know, hey, that was fun. And now it's back as a schedule one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I, I that's, uh, I really appreciate that um, you saying that and also that, that attitude because, um, you know, it, it kind of happened once before. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to repeat it again, right. <laughs> particularly with all the effort that's gone into this, but I, I kind of feel like it, it, um, Maybe again, I'm overly optimistic here, but I think that um, with the evidence that's out there right now and the direction that we're moving in, I, I'm, I'm really hoping that this isn't something that can't be derailed for um, non-scientific reasons. You know, and I think we're, we're at kind of a unique opportunity in the world right now where COVID is really taking so much of the attention on you know, from the FDA, from the FTC. So, you know, I, I think it allows us to really conduct this research in, in almost a FDA vacuum. And not to say that we don't appreciate the efforts of the FDA, but they're, you know, they're a bureaucracy. There's a little, you know, there's a little bit of an archaic structure there. So, you know, science seems to move at a much faster clip than the FDA can keep up with. So, you know, allowing them to focus on the COVID issues and allowing some of this research to take place, uh, you know, within the FDA approved guidelines, but then almost independent of them. So we can really see the benefit, I, I think gives us an opportunity to jump some of this stuff to the head of the class. Yeah. Um, it's uh, also some it's it's pluses and minuses, you know, like the COVID, the downside is that COVID has really made it difficult to do eight hour in person sessions, you know, so there's, but um, no, Which of course, that, mental health yeah. is like such a struggle, I think, for a lot of people right now, especially during this time. So it's almost like we need it more now than ever. Yeah. But there's limitations as well. So. When can you imagine how freaky it would be as if you were in like a, a you know, having hallucinations, you know, you were hallucinating and then you roll over and you see someone with a mask on, you know, that might just scare the shit out of you. <laughs> oh, that, that's an actual problem that we're really struggling to, to deal with. No, that's actually totally right. Like, how do we make it so that there's still that personal connection without it being, because that, because on these compounds, like set in a setting, like that, that is um, really impactful. So we're clear masks and we thought about putting up a giant, you know, like, <laughs> like a, 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 a pexiglass wall and, you know, all sorts of ways of working around it. A but clear it's bubble, a challenge. right? <laughs> clear bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Like bubble boy or something. Yeah. But yeah. can you imagine if you were, you'd think you were sitting next to Bane from Batman, you're like, <laughs> Um, yeah. Dr. Mm -hmm. Gorman, we are, uh, you know, I'm going with the honorifics again. We are out of time here. Um, thank you so much. I mean, there's so much that we covered and, and this is a topic that's not going away. So mm -hmm. we'd love to have you back if you've, uh, you know, if you're up for it, because you know, I think that we're going to sure. get a lot more questions on this one and then we can really do some questions and answers from the field. Yeah, on. I'd love to do that. I love, love, uh, discussion. Um, absolutely. Yeah, Wonderful. Amar, thank you. I think this was just super valuable for a lot of our listeners and for us too. We've, I think I've learned a lot today. So thank you for being here with us today. So where can people find you? Ah, uh, so you can visit me, uh, our website Fluence is www.fluence8, the number eight.com. So fluence8.com. You can email me, uh, I-N-G-M-A-R, Ingmar at fluence8.com. Um, happy to hear from you.
Great. And we'll put all that information in the show notes. So uh, I'm assuming you'll get some comments and some questions on this one as far as people wanting to know a little bit more. And yeah. um, we can funnel some, uh, we'll funnel the rest of the questions. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, make sure to leave those, you know, either on social, on YouTube, um, you know, email, smoke signals. We answer to those on rare <laughs> occasions, especially here in Northern California. Right. People are talking right. a lot to us. <laughs> they might get confused, though, with some of the other. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like, why do you want to eat a frog? Oh, no, wait, sorry. That's just the, you know. <laughs> Amazing. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Reslin and Evan DeMarco. Until next week, thanks for tuning in. Bye, guys.